And from the reading of the poem, I'm going to go right on into the message that I have for tonight. And this poem is entitled, Evaluating Jesus. Friend, what does Jesus mean to you? Enough to prompt you to obey whatever he commands you to, and that without the least delay? Does Jesus mean enough, my friend? Does his great love affect you so to bring all sinning to an end that even evil thoughts must go? Friend, Jesus is preeminent, the greatest issue of our time, the one a loving Father sent as your deliverer and mine. Deliverance from sin we need as nothing else in all our days. And since he can redeem indeed, friend, we owe him the highest praise. And that's the little poem for tonight. Jesus should be central in all preaching. He certainly is central in the Bible, and he deserves to be central in all our lives every day that we live. So my first message in this series beginning tonight is entitled, What Everybody Owes Jesus. I have no special scripture for a text, but we can very well begin with a few thoughts on a few verses in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And if you would like to turn there and follow as I read these two or three verses, and then a comment as we read them. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1 to begin with. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. In that verse, Paul sees in prospect this eternal abode with God above for himself as one of God's people, but really for all of God's people. A marvelous prospect that is, isn't it? It's what makes the Bible just super good, isn't that right? We have this. But now drop down to verse 9. Wherefore we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. That is, whether we remain on earth or whether we leave this earth through the, sh the valley of the shadow of death and go on out to meet the Lord face to face, in either case, our labor is that we may be accepted of him, acceptable to him. Now, we can be or we can't be. We will be or we won't be. Isn't that right? And we need to devote ourselves to the task of making ourselves acceptable to him. And that's what the Bible's all about, giving us the information and the instruction and the guideline whereby we can be acceptable to him. Now down to verses 14 and 15. For the love of Christ constraineth us because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. So in these verses, Paul is recognizing that Jesus did die for all people. We know that. The Bible stresses that over and over. But he also brings out this thought in addition to it, that since 
all have sinned and needed a Savior, and Jesus came as the Savior and died for all who were in need of salvation and the Savior, then in the light of that, all people should not live as they please, but live as he wants them to live. Paul saw it this way, that since Jesus had done so much for him, Paul owed something to the Lord. And we all ought to see it that way. In Galatians 2.20, Paul mentions the fact that Jesus died for me. He loved me and gave himself for me. Paul brought it down to just one person himself. Jesus loved me. He gave himself for me. And when Paul saw it that way, he felt a great debt that he owed to the Lord Jesus himself. There's another verse in 1 John chapter 2, verse 2, where it speaks of Jesus uh, becoming the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. In other words, in Jesus there is enough saving power to cover for the sins of everybody anywhere, regardless who they are. And then when this brings the whole world into focus in relationship to Jesus himself, I'm saying this, that everybody, anybody, anywhere, everywhere, owes something to Jesus. I want to bring that out tonight the best I can. Paul felt that in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. He speaks of uh, Christians having been bought with a price. And we know that price to be the blood of the Son of God. And he says, Now therefore we are to glorify God in the body and in the spirit, which are God's. In those verses, Paul sees, we receive much from Jesus. We owe something back to him. So this is what I'm going to strive to bring out. Jesus is the inescapable factor, the supreme issue, the foremost person of importance in our times and in any generation. And in this message, I want to bring out two major thoughts. One, what all people in general owe Jesus. And second, what Christians in particular owe Jesus. So this is going to touch everybody. First, what all people in general owe Jesus. All people owe Jesus thanks for at least two things. And one of the two things is, they need to thank him for having brought down from God in heaven God's message to the people of this world. For God has spoken to us through his Son, hasn't he? And Jesus faithfully brought that message. Now whether we are going to receive it or not, and whether we're going to pay it any heed or not, we still owe a debt of thanks, and everyone does. For Jesus having brought it, it makes me think of a Western Union messenger boy wheeling his bicycle up to the door and bringing a telegram to you. Well, the very least you can do is to say thank you, and most people do. Maybe they gave him a tip. I remember when my mother sent me over to the neighbor one day with a little note and it wasn't too far away, but my mother was busy, and I took the note over there, and the neighbor lady read it, and she not only thanked me, she gave me a cookie, and I appreciated that. Now the woman respected or recognized the fact that here was a little boy that took the time out of his play day and did what his mother asked him to do, and it was a note of some importance to the neighbor lady. She said, thank you, little boy. Here's a cookie. Another thing that all people should be thankful to Jesus Christ for is 
that for that which he did on the cross for all people. And he did give his life there for the whole world, didn't he? He died for every last human soul. Now, whether people are going to do anything about that sacrifice or not, whether they're going to accept the blessings through that sacrifice or not in obeying his gospel, that's another thing. But I say that everyone still owes him thanks for doing it for them, whether they're going to be saved or not. They owe that to him. He isn't getting it, but I'm saying they owe it to him because he did it for them. Well, let's move on and realize seven things that all people owe him in respect and honor. And the first of these seven things that all people owe Jesus respect and honor for is the flawless, sinless life that he lived. Now, you and I haven't been able to do that, but he did. And no other human being ever has or ever will be able to do that, but he did. I don't know about you, but when my wife puts in a hard day's work in the house and that kitchen floor is clean and waxed and shiny and spotless, you know, I appreciate that and I give her honor. And I show respect to her for going to all the labor and I've done it for her a few times and I'd rather that she do it. And when she does it, I appreciate how it looks when it's all over or uh, when the wash is all taken care of, including the ironing and everything on the racks, you know, in good order. I, I, I like that and I, I respect my wife for taking all the pains and the time to see that that's done or the preparation of a good meal. And if any of you have been at my wife's table, you know that she can do that. And I have been perfectly satisfied for a good many years, and I wouldn't change for anything, not only for the meal's sake, but that included. Jesus lived a sinless, spotless, immaculate life, and everyone owes him the respect and honor for him having done that. And after all, he was subjected to every kind of temptation we are, and he was able to resist it all. So that's another thing. That's one thing that everyone owes Jesus in respect and honor for. Number two is that Jesus, as no other person has ever been able to be, was no respecter of persons. Never once did he fail in this command of God that we be no respecter of persons. Now, whether they were poor or rich, whether they were Jew or Gentile, whether they were young or old, royalty or commoner, Jesus did not discriminate. And this isn't easy, and you know it isn't, and I know it isn't easy, to be no respecter of persons. But he was not. How many did he love? He loved all. Did he love any one more than another? He did not. When he died for all was his death for for um, one over another, not at all. In, in this, we see something that we should be striving for to attain in ourselves, and we don't see it in other people in perfection, but in Jesus we do. And all people owe him respect and honor for attaining unto that that all human beings should and no one has. A third thing that Jesus should be respected and honored for by all people is the fact that all the powers he had, and I'm thinking particularly of his healing power now, that the use and the, and the um, well, yes, the use of this power that he had was always done free of charge, didn't charge anybody a thing, and he didn't refuse anyone who came, and he never failed in any instance of healing, did he? You know he deserves honor and respect for that, doesn't he? All people owe that to him. I'm not going to dwell on any of these too long. Dick says it's only an hour tape, and I'd like to get it within that if I can. Number four, Jesus is to be respected and honored by all people for that good, strong stand he took for what was right 
He never deviated from it one single instance all the years that he lived. Nothing could move him from that stand. Money could not bribe him. Greed could not corrupt him. And all people owe him honor and respect for that firm stand he took on the side of right. And he always was right. And he never once was wrong. He deserves honor and respect from everybody about that. Now the foes of Jesus tried to find every, uh, even some kind of blemish in him, didn't they? And when in the hours before his crucifixion they herded up and, and rounded up every kind of a false witness against him, you will notice that they had to be false ones. They couldn't find anything in his character. And then he was put to death under false accusations. He, uh, he deserves honor and respect, doesn't he? For his standing by right. And here we're, li <coughs> we're living in a day where presidents and presidential appointees and whatnot, however good and well they start out, yet oh, leave it to the media to bring out the defects and the flaws. And what we need is something, a, a counter media to the media that we have, it seems to me. But anyway, uh, a man in the public eye, a man in public office is going to undergo the most severe kind of scrutiny that anyone can. And you remember the recent Lance case. You remember the recent Nixon business. Well, if there are flaws to be found, they will be found and they will be made public. They tried it with Jesus. They couldn't find a one. He deserves honor. He deserves respect. Number five. All people owe Jesus honor and respect for the fact that he was a non-violent person. He was no advocate of war. He didn't go around challenging people to pugilism. He didn't carry a chip on his shoulder. He never once came anywhere near retaliating against anyone who abused or wronged him, he was no one to stir up mob violence as they did against him and as they did against his apostles. But no, Jesus never once was guilty of committing or fomenting violence of any kind. When Peter drew out his sword and smote Malchus' ear, Jesus said, put that sword up. Jesus wouldn't have it. He was that kind. Now, there are some in our day who are trying to pass off as emulators of Jesus by stirring up troubles. Well, you know what? They're more emulating the enemies of Jesus than they are of Jesus. I say that Jesus deserves respect and honor from all people for the fact that he was nonviolent. Number six. He's to be respected and honored by all people for the compassion that he showed for all people, all kinds of people, regardless who they were. He was compassionate toward sinners without tolerating their sin. You have that illustrated in the case. John chapter 8, the woman taken in adultery. Very compassionate toward her, but he did tell her to go and sin no more, didn't he? He loved the woman, he couldn't tolerate her sin, he couldn't, he couldn't condone it. And he appealed to her to be done with it and then and forevermore. But we can't, Terry, I must move faster. Number seven, Jesus is to be honored and respected for his steadfastness to the will of God from the time he became conscious of the will of God for his life to the very second that he perished on the cross. He was steadfast to the will of God through every kind of thing that came his way. Nothing could turn him from it. Against all wrong, against all temptation, through great suffering, even to and including the death on the cross, he was a doer of the will of his Father who is in heaven. Now the world honors people who are true to a cause books are written about them. Jesus never flinched through the cruelest ordeals. 
He never retreated from it. He never gave apology for his stand in the will of God. And certainly he never compromised for those things. I think I said at the beginning there would be eight things. It comes out to be only seven things that all people owe him respect and honor for. There could be more, but this is all I have in the notes. Now, I want in the third place concerning what all people owe Jesus in general. All people owe him consideration for these two things among many others. All people owe him consideration for his proven claims that rightly demand things of them. Now, what are these proven claims? Notice I say proven claims. He claimed to be the Son of God. Is he? Surely he is. Is it proven? Yes, it is proven. Now, since it is a proven claim that he is the Son of God, therefore people should obey him. They owe him that consideration. And the second of these two things that all owe him consideration for is that which he is able to do for them, which is the greatest need they have, and which they can't do for themselves and nobody else can do for them, and that is to redeem their souls from certain damnation. Jesus can do that, and he's the only one who can do that. And in the light of that, that he can forgive, he can pardon, he can redeem, like First John 2, 2 says, he is the propitiation, the covering over, the blotting out, the removing from sight, of our sins, but not only ours, but the sins of the whole world. Since Jesus can do that, then everyone owes him consideration for the lordship, the rulership, the authority that God has given unto him both in heaven and on earth. Possibly those people on the day of Pentecost looked at it something like this, that when they heard Peter preach, that this same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, God has made both Lord and Christ. It was right then that some of them being pricked in their hearts cried out, Brethren, what shall we do? And when Peter told them to repent and be baptized, in whose name? In the name of Jesus Christ. Some 3,000 responded, and that's the way all people should. All people owe Jesus consideration for the fact that he is the Savior and can save. And when the command in his name, by his authority, is given to repent and be baptized, all people owe it to him to repent and be baptized. But from this, I want to move ahead now concerning the people who have repented and been baptized. And so we come to this second major division, what all Christians in particular owe Jesus. Well, this could be an almost endless list, but I have these few things to mention. One is that all Christians owe Jesus lifelong allegiance complete allegiance, unwavering and unapologetic allegiance, if I might word it that way. Jesus is Lord, Jesus is King, as far as Christians are concerned. Amen? He is that. Now, as long as Jesus is Lord and as long as Jesus is King, then all Christians owe it to him to be allegiant to him personally. Jesus is only good to people. He means only good for them. He will never do a thing or ask a thing of anyone, but that it will be for that person's good. He is a leader. He is a commander. He is a general. We might use those terms. And he is the very best sort of a leader to whom we can yield allegiance. 
I would rather yield allegiance to him than any other person I know. Far more, far more. Christians owe this to him. Jesus has no blemish in him. And it's an honor to me to be privileged to be allegiant to him, to obey him, and to do what he asks me to do. Another thing that all Christians owe Jesus is pure lives. Pure lives. You know, it's to defame the name of Jesus by one's claiming to be his and yet not really going all out for purity of life. It defames the name of the Lord because many people judge the Lord by what the Lord's people are. Jesus wants you and me as Christians, body, soul, and mind. We are his. We've been bought with that price. And it's our stewardship to keep that which is his pure. That's our responsibility. And it honors him by our being pure in life, pure in speech, pure in action, pure in thought. Having saved us from degradation of sin, we owe it to him to keep ourselves from any further sin. We do. So a Christian should very seriously ponder the matter of owing Jesus a pure life to the extent of giving up anything and everything which would be harmful to that body which is his that mind which is his. And you can begin with such things as tobacco and dope and drink and what not. You and I, as Christians, owe it to Jesus to be pure. You agree? We owe that to him. We certainly do. Well, a third thing is that we owe Jesus this debt, as it were, to bring no grief or sorrow to him because of our waywardness and departure from his will. This is a hard problem for us, I know. I don't know how you ever think of it, but I realize that I have heard a great deal in my life, both before and after becoming a Christian. And where it causes my conscience a great deal of disturbance, I like to think that it caused him a little disturbance too. And I remember when I was a little boy at home, I really loved my daddy. I had a good daddy, a real good one. I honored him very highly. And I honor his memory just as high to this day. But do you know there were times when I would do things that were against his will, and I knew it. And after having done it, I felt the guilt for myself, but I also felt even worse because of what I knew it would do to him. He expected obedience from me because he was a wonderfully good father to me, and I owed it to him, but he didn't get it all the time. And I owe it to Jesus, and so do you. And when we fail, let's remember that Jesus can be disappointed, and Jesus can be hurt as well as any human being. Now, we ought to him to spare him this grief and sorrow, especially coming from people who wear his name. So the next time you're tempted to more or less casually give in to something that is wrong, Put on the brakes and just think for a minute. Now, what is this going to do to my Lord? Is it going to give him pain? Is it going to, going to cause him distress, sorrow? Well, of course it will. Then let's be sure that we spare him that as much as we can. Number four, all Christians owe it to Jesus to give the adversaries of our Lord no occasion to mock him through us 
and our failures and oh how the enemies of Jesus love to use a Christian's failures to flaunt the Lord with and to belittle Christianity with and to downgrade the church with. They love to do that. You know, I fear many lost people are lost because of this very thing, that they see the so-called saved people sporting on forbidden ground and they see themselves no worse off than these Christians so-called and they wonder, well, why should I become a Christian when they're doing the same things I do? Number five, a harmonious church, a heavenly-minded church. Holy means pure, of course, and since we as Christians are a part of his church, then we owe it to him to see to it that as far as we are concerned that church is holy and that it's harmonious and that it's heavenly-minded. And I stress that latter one, heavenly-minded, because there are still too many of us probably who are much yet too, yet much too earthly-minded, too materially oriented, where we should be more and more heavenly-minded and spiritually concerned. Christians owe it to Jesus to see to it that the church is one he is pleased with, one that he can use, and one that when he comes he will be most happy to present to himself a holy church without blemish, spot, wrinkle, any such thing. And when we consider that there are the jealousies and there are the nitpickings and there are the backbitings and there are the, um, oh, the complainings and the, and the growlings and the grumblings and there's the power-seeking and the verbal pugilism and whatnot that goes on within the ranks of the church of our Lord, I tell you, Christians owe it to Jesus to have a church rid of these things. They owe it to him. And if we could just remember our debt to him, I think we'd work a little harder about these matters, wouldn't we? I mention these things because they're so commonplace. I'm not talking about strange things a thousand miles away, am I? These are things we have to combat every day that we live. You know, we're a people who stress the faith and the repentance and the baptism as steps for an individual in the state of sin to come in to the relationship of the saved with the Lord. But you know the same Lord has pointed out that uh, patience and forbearance and long-suffering and brotherly kindness, things like that are also in his divine will for his people. And it demands peace and it, it demands no contention or contentiousness and we being the human pe beings we are and subject to the limitations and shortcomings of the flesh as we are it's easy for us to point out the faith the repentance the confession the baptism the lord's supper and so on but we also need to devote much much time to, to these other qualities of the christian character and the christian life that the Lord Jesus so much, so much wants. I, I think of poor old Jacob and his twelve sons. He had one son named Joseph, you remember that, and there were ten older brothers that hated Joseph to the point that they wanted to murder that boy. And except for Reuben's intervention, they would have murdered him. But they did sell him as a slave into Egypt, but here's one thing that is pointed out so clearly back there in Genesis, and that is that with all of the combined enmity and envy and jealousy and hatred of the brothers against Joseph, Joseph was still God's man. He's the one God had already appointed and selected to be used for the preservation of the whole nation. I think it's well to note that Joseph's compassion for his brothers and his lack of any hatred to his brothers is noble and great as well. We can take a lot of, uh, we can learn a lot from a study of Joseph and his brothers, can't we? Both on their part and his part. Sometimes I think the military shows more of what the church ought to be like 
than the church itself does. For I remember, and I'm not bragging about this by any means, but I did spend a year or two in the National Guard up in Webster City, Iowa, and I, I learned things pretty fast. That just as a plain, simple old private, when that sergeant came strutting around there and gave an order and a command, we privates would do very well to keep our mouths shut and do what he said and cooperate with him and march on together, step in, uh, a step, a step by step, in step with each other and all the others of higher rank, the lieutenants and on up to the captain and so on. That was a lesson I learned in the military. If you're going to make a workable unit, you might not like the looks of your sergeant, and you might not like the way he struts around, but you've got to remember that he is in authority over you, and you're to take his commands. We have someone in authority over us too, don't we? As a son of God, and oh how we need to show the world that we can work together in spite of our differences on this, that, and the other thing and still listen to the commands of our captain and go in step with each other right on to the doing of the will of the Lord. I played basketball in my high school days and I remember in my senior year we players knew 10,000 times more about basketball than the coach did. He was the science teacher and he should have stayed there. But... Uh, we came up to the sectional tournament and we didn't have any hope at all of going anywhere. Well, we won that first game. And the second game played up and that uh, little team from Baxter, Iowa was one of the dark horses in the outlook for the finals in the state tournament at Des Moines. We beat that team. And then eyebrows began to raise up and we even got our pictures on the front page of the Des Moines Sunday Register. And we tackled a third team that was also a powerhouse in the, in the state and we beat them too. And we came right down to the final game, but we got beat in that last game by a few points. But what I'm trying to bring out is this, that that little team, we only had 10 boys out for basketball. That's all that came out, just 10. Well, we had a first team and enough subs to fill in for each one. But on that team, there was not one that was any particular outstanding player. We worked together as a unit. We worked out our plays and we did our best to see to it that we worked as a unit. There was no glory hog in the midst of us. And we went through that season losing only three games. And I thought that was pretty good without a coach, so to speak. And when the Marshalltown Times Republican came out with its selection for the first team of that whole, uh, all the uh, teams in the sectional tournament, one of the boys made it on the first team while the rest of them came around and slapped on the back. Boy, we're glad you made it. That was me. <laughs> I made the first team on the Marshalltown uh, selection. Anyway, it goes to show that even though there were vast differences in our makeup, in our disposition, our likes and dislikes, when it came to playing the game, we worked together. We forgot the other things. We concentrated on this and we made it with quite a record that year. That's the way it ought to be in the church, amen? Oh, we have our differences. We surely do. But you know, for the glory of the Lord and for his sake, we owe him a harmonious church, a church of every member working together with each other. And when Paul uses that statement, I think it's in Colossians, forbearing one another in love. Do you know if every Christian would practice that one little teaching right there, just about all of the problems and troubles and difficulties would disappear. You believe that? I kind of do myself. All right. Well, I dwelt a little longer there than I intended. Now, here's another thing that all Christians owe to Jesus. This is number six. They owe Jesus spiritual, contented, happy homes and families. They owe that to Jesus where the husbands and the wives 
are everything the Lord teaches through the scriptures they ought to be. Now the husband is to be the head of the wife. The Bible says so. And the wife is to be in subjection to the husband. The Bible says so. That is the plan of the Lord. And if the husband, in his rulership and headship, is the kind of man he ought to be, loving his wife, tender-hearted, considerate, and taking her into many of the discussions concerning the decisions that finally befall him to make. And if the wife respects him in the way the Bible teaches she should, and if she is humble, and if she is willing to abide by the Lord's teachings as to her role in the married state, it, it can't help but be the kind of home the Lord will be pleased with. In the home, the children are to be obedient, and the parents are to see to it that they are. God is to be honored in the home, and the church is to be a very central part of the plans of the family for the week, and particularly on the Lord's Day and those midweek meetings, revival meetings, rallies, and what have you. I tell you, these things come first with God's people, don't they? They should, and this is what Christians owe Jesus. Children who can honestly honor their parents as noble, upright, God-fearing, exemplary people, I tell you, those children are the kind of children that are to be blessed and honored for having parents like that. I remember when Victor wrote that article some years ago why he decided to preach. I didn't know he'd even written the article. He never told me anything about it, and I picked up a little paper once and opened it up, and there was a tie, there was an article, Why I Decided to Preach by Victor Knowles. I said, well, this will be interesting, so I started to read it. Well, one of his points was because of the example of his dad. And you know what his dad did when he saw that? His dad cried. He really did. I just couldn't read it any farther. I just had to wait till the tears stopped. And I thought, his old dad, that old bumbling, floundering, prone-to-mistake fella, his dad, that it was my example that helped him to decide to preach? Well, praise the Lord that there was enough about his dad that he could see that was worth emulating. Amen. Number seven, Christians owe Jesus more than God ever got from the Jews. That's quite a thought, isn't it? And I'm thinking of just one verse, Matthew 5, 20, where Jesus said, Except your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall no eyes enter the kingdom of heaven. God didn't get everything from the Jews that they owed God, and we owe Jesus more than God ever got from them. Now, I'm just going to let that one rest and go to the number eight, and this is the last, and I'm about done. Christians owe Jesus fervent, constant, private, and public praise. Sometimes Christians are taunted by non-Christians, and they're ridiculed, and they're twitted about being really dedicated Christian people. And I've often thought, and I've never been dealt with that way. No one has ever come up to me and made fun of me for my being a Christian, but I know other people have. But I thought that if someone would come up to me and just start making fun of me and twit me about being a, a surrendered person to Christ, I believe I'd want to make a reply to that person something like this, and I wrote it out, and I'm going to read it just the way I wrote it. Look, you, Jesus took my part he came down from heaven, he took my sins upon himself, he invited me to be one of his people, he gives me promises unbelievable, on his own, under no obligation to me, because he saw me in need, with no other one able to help and went to his death on that awful cross to give me my chance. 
scoff at him as you will, laugh at me as you please. I owe him this praise, these thanks, my life, my all, and I'm going to see that he gets it. Now that's the kind of reply I think I'd want to make to a man who would come up to me and make fun of me for being a Christian. When he makes fun of me for being a Christian, he's makes, making fun of Christ as my Savior. And I shouldn't stand for that, should I? No Christian should. Here in this recent Vietnam, Vietnam debacle, there were some uh, American citizens who became so un-American that they would burn the flag, trump it underfoot, spit on it. American citizens so un-American. And those who were so violently opposed to our soldiers in Vietnam, they didn't hesitate to come out in public eye, did they, and denounce the administration for carrying on that war against those people over there? And they caused a lot of trouble in this country, didn't they? But the point I'm getting at is that being their thought, their feeling, their conviction, they didn't hesitate to make it known publicly. And we shouldn't hesitate to make known our belief in Christ publicly. We owe it to him to give him constant, fervent, private and public praise for who he is, for what he does for us. And let's be sure that he gets it. Jesus is all the world to me, and true to him I'll be. Oh, how could I this friend deny when he's so true to me? Isn't that a good thought from one of the hymns we sing? And another one, stand up, stand up for Jesus, the trumpet call obey. Forth to the mighty conflict in this his glorious day. Ye that are men now serve him against unnumbered foes. Let courage rise with danger and strength to strength oppose. I heard tell of a man who had served his community and area in a remarkably fine way for many, many years. And they had planned a night in which he was going to be honored rightly so, justly so. And so the night came. And on the platform with this distinguished gentleman were other bigwigs, at dignitaries, and as one by one, those seated on the platform would get up and say a few words in honor to this one who was being honored. There was quite an ovation. And then when it finally came the turn of the man himself to speak, walking up to the speaker's stand, the audience rose and gave a thunderous acclamation, hand clapping for this man. When it subsided and they were seated, he thanked them for it very quietly. And he said that he could not take all the praise and all the honor without sharing it with another person who really deserved it more than did he. And right then he turned and walked to the very end of the row of seats to an old lady that was sitting there dressed in very common clothing, nothing gaudy. And he escorted her from her seat to the rostrum, to the speaker stand, put his arm around her, and he told the people that it was this woman, his mother, who deserved the honor as much, if not more, than did he for it was his mother who in the days of his youth taught him the dignity of right, of truth, of courtesy, of helpfulness, fair play, industry, 
and dedication to his country and to God. And this man said that without her consistent, faithful, loving, kindly teaching and training, he never could have been or done what he had come to be and do. And for a few seconds it was just as still as could be. And then another thunderous ovation louder than the first. Do you know, that's what we owe Jesus. Everything that we are for any good as Christians, it's because of him, people. Isn't that right? We don't have a thing to brag about. Not a thing. You can name anything you want in the list of good, in the list of abilities, but that it all goes back to Jesus. That's why I said in the beginning that all preaching should be centered on Jesus. It should be. And I thought this would be a good sermon with which to begin this series tonight. Praise him. Praise him. Jesus, our blessed Redeemer. Sing, O earth, his wonderful love proclaim. Hail him, hail him, highest archangels in glory. Strength and honor give to his holy name. Praise him, praise him, Jesus, our blessed Redeemer. For our sins he suffered and bled and died. And as Paul said, he loved me and gave himself for me. Just pin that on your own lapel. Yes, he died for all, but he died for you as an individual, not just as a number. He knew you needed it. He died for you. Don't we owe him great praise, though? Shan't we see that he gets it? And as we sing the closing song, which is number 120, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross, as Christians we should and we shall. And we're going to do it literally, but in the singing of this song, let's make it a dedication song to still a deeper consecration to him and greater purposefulness of life to the glory of our Lord. These are a lot of things to think about, I know. There could be more said. Now, if there's one here tonight that isn't that way in your thinking and you know that you ought to be and you want to be, well, will you let us know in one way or another? Come forward, talk to us afterwards. We want to be a help. We want to be everything we can be to you in the light of your need for your own spiritual salvation. Let's stand as we say praise. Stand up, stand up. Since one has come, maybe another might, and maybe another needs to. We want this meeting to be the kind that gets people right with God. Amen. Now, whether you're a non-Christian or a Christian, there might be a need there, a deep-seated need that needs to be met. And there's only one way to meet it, and that's in the light of what the Bible says. We can help you on that. We certainly can. So let's sing the second verse of the song. If another needs to come, will you do it now while we sing verse 2, please?
Tina wants to become a Christian tonight. She's been thinking about this for a while. And uh, some of the young folks of the church here have been working with her and talking with her, especially uh, Carol and Mary. And I have to remark about one or two things. Every once in a while, young people say, now, we don't get to do anything. Uh, Once in a while, our young folks will say that. Now, Carol was kind of thinking about that a few days ago. This is one thing that Carol got to do, to have a part in. Now there are things that Christians don't get to do, if you want to call it that. But this is something you do get to do that I think far out uh, outmeasures anything that the fleshly part of us would like to do. <clears throat> Tina lives just across the highway from us and she told Nancy the other day that she could tell that our family is a little bit different. Of course that kind of is what the brother preached about tonight. And uh, naturally that makes a difference over a period of time. Tina's the last uh, one of the family as far as the children are concerned and we have seen some of the other of the family come, but Tina has always kind of thought a little more seriously and has had longer time, I guess, to be around a couple of girls that are her own age. And sometimes uh, you get a little impatient as parents seeing all these children come in and out of your house, a gouge left here and something broken over here, and you think, oh my. Oh, I'd say a couple, three years ago, um, I had something sitting out on the bench and one of the young folks, visiting young folks, threw the hammer in there and bang, go it, broke it all to pieces. (laughs) Wham. Kind of expensive. But you think, well, maybe a little time, something good will come out of all this. And tonight is one of those. So we're glad that uh, Tina had the privilege of of hearing a good message, almost a total revival in one message. Good thoughts. We can go home and think about these. What do we owe Jesus? Well, we owe him an awful lot. So those of you who can stay, we'll pray and be dismissed. And those of you who can stay... We'd certainly be glad to have you stay. We'll be having the service in a short time. So let's stand and be dismissed, please. Brother Don Hunt, would you pray, please? Our Father, we are thankful for this young lady that has come tonight and thinking about Christ. Thank <laughs> you.